We're live. Okay. Bye bye. We're live. There we go. Okay. Hello. Do we see straight away if people are joining? I th I think so. I don't know. Oh, there's one oh, person. There is. There's Hello. one person. <laughs> probably my mom hi mom hi mom hi dad yeah there's your dad <laughs> oh, okay I'm there's your people. husband okay <laughs> okay i think we should start yes all right okay i'll start hello i'm jesse hi i'm stacy halls oh yeah i'm jesse burton sorry i've got my surname and um we are very lucky tonight to be able to take over waterstones ig live yes. they did give us the password we have hijacked and yeah we thought we would start by reading the back of each other's books this was um, my request this was Stacey's <laughs> request which i actually thought was quite a good one um so i'm gonna go first and uh read the back of the foundling which is stacy's paperback which is out today her second novel and then i'm gonna read jesse's the confession I'm gonna read the whole in my best reading voice <laughs> gonna read the whole book and we oh we're back okay two women bound by a child and a secret that will change everything london 1754. Six years after leaving her illegitimate daughter, Clara, at London's Foundling Hospital, Bess Bright returns to reclaim the child she has never known. Dreading the worst that Clara has died in care, Bess is astonished to be told she has already claimed her. Her life is turned upside down as she tries to find out who has taken her little girl and why. Less than a mile from Bess's lodgings in the city, a rich young widow has not left her house in a decade. When she is asked to hire a nursemaid for her daughter, she is hesitant to welcome someone new into her home and her life, but her past is threatening to catch up with her and tear her carefully constructed world apart. That sounds quite good. I've it read it, it's, so. it's pretty good. It's, <laughs> it's a beautiful book. And The Confession by Jessie Burton, also out today in paperback. When Elise Morceau meets the writer Constance Holden, she quickly falls under her spell. Connie is sophisticated, bold and alluring. Everything Elise feels she is not. She follows Connie to LA, but in this city of strange dreams and razzle-dazzle, Elise feels even more out of her depth and makes an impulsive decision that will change her life forever. Three decades later, Rose Simmons is trying to uncover the story of her mother, who disappeared when she was a baby. Having learned that the last person to see her was a now reclusive novelist, Rose finds herself at the door of Constance Holden's house in search of a confession. <gasps> that sounds great. Well, wow. And Elizabeth Day says it's without doubt one of the best novels of recent years. Oh, what very, an accolade. Well, it's very generous of her. Actually, when we were reading the backs of each other's books mm. before we started, mm. we realised there's actually quite a lot in common there. Houses, babies who don't have their mothers yeah for the early years of their lives and then a search to sort of reconnect that's strange that it is yeah <laughs> and that's something we're going to discuss <laughs> exactly. over the next 45 minutes or so yeah we were thinking about that long um so how it's going to work is we took questions from um followers of the waterstones instagram account and we have them in this lovely little bowl and our own ig's Jess's actually kitchen. and our own ig's yeah. yeah so thanks if you put a question in thank you very much and we also have some burning questions that we wanted to ask each other that are a bit more fun fun <laughs> yeah a bit more frivolous <laughs> yeah but we thought we'd start with the serious ones. We'll start first. with the serious ones. Okay. Yeah. And That's why everyone's here. Yeah, exactly. And the way we'll do it is we... Is it going to come back? Yeah, we're back. Yeah. It, we'll pick a question and we'll both answer both it. Both answer it. So yeah. I'm going to pose this to you first. Okay. So Queen George from the Waterstones um, Q&A thingy, she asked, how long did the writing process for, in this case, The Foundling take you? So my books I found now that I've written three... Um, they take me about a year from starting the first draft to kind of finishing the copy edit. So I actually got the idea for The Foundling at a bit of an annoying time. Um, I had just finished writing the first draft of The Familiars. This was back in 2016. Um, and I wasn't looking for an idea for a story, but I went along to the Foundling Museum and um, got the idea for the story there because I was just so moved by this incredible place. I'd never even <laughs> heard of it before. I just went along and... Um, was sort of won over by its mission and the fact that so many women needed it and um, so many babies were left there. Um, and I sort of came away thinking, oh, I've got a story idea, but there's nothing I can really do about that because I've just finished the first draft of this one that I was working on, which was The Familiars. Um, so I had to kind of park it 
and then it was probably about a year later that I actually came to sit down and start thinking about what it would be and started the research so I sold I basically sold that as part of a two book deal to my publisher so when they bought the familiars from me um they wanted to buy a second book from me which I was thrilled about and thankfully I had the idea um even though it was an idea it was still they were happy enough to buy it and here it is Pausing due to bad connection, but I we hope that back. we will always come back. How about you? What's your process? Like? Oh, so the writing process in terms of duration is different. Like this one, The Confession, I think I started it in the summer of 2018. Um, and I delivered a first draft at the um, end of 2019. And then I edited it until um, kind of like April or May of 20. No, that's wrong. I'm a year <laughs> melts i mean a whole you year just handed it in a month ago yeah i mean all of that in 2017 i yeah. started it yeah just, it's, it's kind of it's really hard to remember years honestly i just can't remember writing my books because you're always year. like 18 to two, 18 months to two years ahead aren't you yeah kind of but i also feel like when you're writing there's kind of like your normal life yeah and then there's your book life at the same time and you know when you're writing anything the time just is not measured by minutes and hours like it's you know especially yeah. if you're writing other people's lives and other people every time because I've just handed in my first draft of book three and that took me eight months and that was me working on it full-time that's actually the first book I've written where it's been my full-time job mm. the other two were when I still had a job so maybe I was you, a you bit have, better then you have a job now <laughs> your job, job is, now. Is, yeah. is novel writing that's true do you want to pick one yes um okay so this one is from rosanna holt without industry connections what's the best route to publication i mean my stance on this is that you don't need to have industry connections and i think this is a bit of a myth quite frankly mm -hmm. um i don't think you need to know anyone in publishing to have a book published despite what i don't know it seems to be something that sort of everyone thinks is is a barrier um, I didn't know anyone when I wrote my book. I just sent it in, followed the instructions of literary agency websites, sent in three chapters and a synopsis. And yeah, I didn't hear from lots and lots of people. I don't think it's a necessary at all. You just have to write a good book, which sounds perhaps a little trite and, you know, and I think that, you know, a good book, if you're persistent, it will, it will get noticed it's just not when you think it will and not in the way you think it will but my i maintain you do not need to have industry connections yeah i would agree with that because i actually did have industry connections when i wrote the familiars i was working as a journalist um at a women's magazine and previous to that i'd been working at the bookseller magazine which is the publishing industry trade magazine so i knew quite a lot of people in publishing although more on the publicity side than editorial I actually knew no agents mm. however the first novel that I submitted to agents and we actually share an agent we both represented by Juliet Mushins um I didn't know Juliet before I submitted to her but the first book that I submitted to agents including Juliet who turned me down <laughs> was not the familiars and I think that's really important to remember if anyone is think is if anyone's feeling a bit frustrated or disheartened because they don't know anyone. I did know people and I still got rejected. <laughs> and you still didn't get a book <laughs> I still deal. didn't get a book deal. Yeah. Um, and I Julia think... actually was the only agent who got back to me with any sort of um, mm. constructive feedback. And she said to me, this one's not for me, but um, I think you're going to write something else. Mm. And when you do, send that to me. Yeah. And I thought, oh God, like I can't even think about what I'm going to write next. And that ended up being the familiars. And then she went on to represent me. By which time we had got to know each other definitely more but like it wasn't a situation of she would have taken me on anyway no definitely not. and i also think often you know if agents and publishers are looking for a way to kind of market an author they would rather have found you off the slush pile or that you were a i don't know a plumber or a teacher or 100 something that's not in bloody publishing i think you know they're, yeah. they're always preferring that kind of thing mm -hmm. next question both of you like to write portraits of spirited women at odds with the society around them. Why is that? Good question. That was from Umbrella 54. Umbrella 54. Thank you for that. Um, I guess there's kind of a couple of things to say about that. So just from a writer's point, 
just from a, a writer's point of view to answer that question about writing spirited women at odds with the society around them you definitely want to have active characters so there's, it's no good having you know like a passive dowdy kind of boring <laughs> although they are fun don't... too i don't know <laughs> maybe not as the main character i think to, to move a story along and to make it a story they have to kind of be out of their comfort zone in some way and they absolutely do change and grow as the book goes on so there's that there's that approach to it where you need to make the character change and throw them into a situation that they're almost not comfortable with or that's unusual to them and then also i think that i am drawn to writing historical fiction primarily for this reason which is it's quite annoying that it keeps dropping yeah can, apparently the connection repeat. keeps dropping so bear with us if we cut and come back but you i'll know. just start at the beginning of the sentence again so i'm yeah. i'm drawn particularly to write in historical fiction because historic history just keep talking it doesn't matter. okay Hi- historically society hasn't been that kind to women and it's not always been that easy for us to exist um in the spaces that we occupy now so um I particularly am drawn to writing about more about like the constraints placed on women that they're bound by rather than them kind of it's more I work from there inwards rather than their outwards if that makes sense like I don't think right what um how's this woman how's this character going to smash the patriarchy how is she gonna um go above and beyond her means and kind of break out of the mold that society has has scribed for her it's more of you know I think in someone like Bess's case in the foundling she has an illegitimate baby which in George and London was um absolutely common but absolutely not acceptable what would she do about that rather than rather than the idea of her you know going to find her child so Mm. that kind of came to me secondary um how do you how would you answer that question I mean it's as something that I'm always asked like you know all your women always have opinions and they're very brave or they and i i just sort of see them as just women yeah there's <laughs> like, no strong men category no Netflix. oh you've written so many strong spirited men <laughs> yeah maybe it's because i suppose in a kind of historical you know voice and um like you said it's always quite attractive to write characters who have gumption and who who propel the action forward mm-hmm. um but i guess it's just it's just a kind of organic process that these characters come out of me and that you know they ask questions and they're not particularly satisfied with their um circumstances that you know they're not you know they may only have freedom through marriage or you know motherhood or you know they're trying to find other routes to be I think that's common in all of my novels and in the confession um Connie I think because of her wealth and her status has enabled to kind of transcend those those boundaries of society she's a gay woman but she doesn't you know that you know she doesn't feel that that she's suffered for that at all but others have and even in the 80s it certainly did so because the 80s is as, as modern as you've oh no, yeah no the confession is 2018 yeah, yeah right yeah so half of it is 1980s and the other half is 2017 18 um but yeah it's a good question I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock because we've got a hell of a lot of questions in here <laughs> i don't Next know if question. we're gonna have time okay um, how has your writing process changed since becoming full-time writers? Um, I guess quite a lot in that I now have the whole day <laughs> to write anything <laughs> or procrastinate. Um, before I was squ- before I finished my third one, I've written them all in different circumstances. So the first one I wrote on a sabbatical from work, so I wrote it in like two months that I took off work, um, and then went back to work and started editing it and did that around my full-time job and then I went down to four days of wandering um breaks weekends my social life just went out of the window and that's when I thought right I'm gonna have to commit to this I'm gonna have to commit full-time because I don't want my work to suffer and my third book that I have just finished the first draft of was the first time I've written a book full-time and it's definitely a huge adjustment I don't know if you found this yeah well it's that thing like more pressure well when you don't have so when I was first writing The Miniaturist, I was a PA in the city, as well as an actress, but like, <laughs> realistically, the phone was not ringing so much, so I was like, working as a temp in the city. And the fact that I was doing a job I didn't enjoy, and I didn't want to be doing it, created a sense of desire, yeah. and um, determination, and bloody-mindedness, and a sort of sense like, I really wanted to get out of this situation. Um, make it sound perilous. <laughs> Existentially, it was a bit perilous. But... Um, then you know I got to work full time as a writer and suddenly like you say there's just these acres and acres of hours which you know 
one day I'll probably look back at time, but you can only, I sometimes work more effectively in one hour or two hours a day. Me too. This idea that everyone has to like get up at 6.30. Yeah. Get to the desk. I think that's a real hangover of it's, like office culture, which both of us have worked in. So yeah. There's an idea that you have to be working from nine till five thirty or six, and if you're yeah. if you're not doing that, then you're time wasting. But, but it's actually, also the romanticisation of writing. Yeah. Like that you you know you get to your desk and you've done three hours by nine a.m. and then you go for a cold swim. Yeah. And then you drink. I do that every day. Well, I mean, I, I do that too. <laughs> and then you have a shot of whiskey, and then you know. Yeah. But it's just. I think it's a question that people always want to know, but like, you know, what's the writing process? And I'm like, I just write these books and somehow yeah. they get done around the edges. It's just, it's actually really painful and dull, the act of writing. <laughs> I know. It's very it's repetitive. It's not enjoyable. It's enjoyable maybe like one in 20 times, I don't know, like a 20th of the time maybe. Absolutely. When you get a sense of flow. Yeah, which yeah. is rare. But that's what it is. And I think that, you know, the, the kind of cliche of like 99 perspiration, 1% inspiration is a cliche for a reason because it's yeah. kind of true. I agree you know, with that. Yeah. there's, it's just being willing to turn up every day and like stare at either a blank page or a page of words that are not what you wanted them to. Sometimes I feel more proud of myself in a really painful like four hours and written like 500 words that were really hard rather than if I've had like an easy breezy morning where it's coming yeah. quite naturally. Yeah. You feel like you've like, <laughs> earned it or yeah. worked hard. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't get easier though, which no. is what I found. No, it doesn't. You. No, all it gets is more familiar. Mm. <laughs> what do you admire most about the other's writing? I'll answer that first. Okay. <laughs> I absolutely love, right from your first novel, um, so I got sent a proof of Jessie's novel when I, as I mentioned, worked at the bookseller magazine, and I remember it was black wasn't it yeah it was like, like a super matte, matte cover yeah super matte cover with like a gold house the tiny mm -hmm. house in the corner yeah and i could just tell that this was a book i was gonna love and i put it right to the top of my to read pile so this is back in when was it published 2014 yeah but you would have got Six that in 2013 2013 so seven years ago when i was a baby mm -hmm. um i was still old then and Every novel that she's written since, including that one, I just absolutely, you're just there in the world that she creates. And she, she's just, she's just a master at creating this real place that you just dive headfirst into that's completely absorbing, no matter if you're on the tube or at home or, I don't know, on I mean... park bench, you're just there. Like you're there in the church in Amsterdam and you're there in Spain in the Thinker and you're there on Hampstead Heath and... You're, you're just so you're great at atmosphere and you're amazing you're just an amazing world builder so that would be my favorite Thank that's you, my Stace. compliment to you gosh i need you sort of as my hype man every morning you need to be at my desk saying that i'll be there Please. Nine, I'll just nine to five saying it. that'll yeah. be my new job great i think for me both with the foundling and the familiars it's it's the characters it's it's oh. it's the woman like fleetwood and bess but also alexandra i think you have a great sympathy for people and um you know kind of going back to that earlier question about you know spirited women but in societies that you know aren't necessarily letting them breathe properly you really successfully inhabit that gray area for those women you know like you, you don't choose for them to like be ball busters yeah but they have an inner strength and a power nevertheless and i think that's quite a difficult thing to pull off in historical fiction um and in any novel but yeah i feel always drawn to what's going on for them and I always feel very invested in them and particularly for a character like Alexandra in this who you know could be in quotes the baddie mm. you know you almost set her up like who's this horrendous woman who took this baby away and then you learn her story and you're like ah oh, yeah both hard both hard having both of them have had hard experiences so oh, I think thanks. you have you have a master I've got my little question hand oh that ties in quite nicely to this next question from blueberry dreams both the foundling and the confession have dual narratives at what point do you decide to write it that way and what are the challenges <sighs> yeah because i've got the muses jewel as well yeah seen, since miniature is incapable of setting a book in one place um i think for me it was almost a technical thing because i have rose simmons's life she's 34 she's in 21st century london but she needs to find out what happened to her mother 30 years ago. And I, rather than have someone literally sit and tell her like reported speech about a story that happened once upon a time, I went back to the 1980s and I split the narrative. Um, and that was evident fairly early on that I had to, to do that. How about you? 
Um, mine actually didn't happen very early on. So I planned to write the, all of the family from Bess's point of view. Oh, and really? then about a third of the way in, it became quite clear to me that that she kind of, without giving any spoilers away, she finds out where her daughter is quite early on. I'm not going to tell you how or where, but um, I then realised that I had to flip the viewpoint and get into the head of this person who has mm. her, which we've mentioned is Alexandra. You don't, that's not a spoiler, you don't know who she is. But um, I, I emailed my R agent and I was like, I think this might have to be a dual narrative. How do you feel about that? And she was like, just do whatever feels right. Try it and you'll find out very quickly or not. And I'd never written anything like that before. Um, I'd only written two novels before that. But mine is not, I guess, traditional dual narrative in that the first third is told by Bess, the, the middle third by um, Alexandra and the final third by Bess. So it's this kind of linear mm. duality where... Um, it's like three acts. Yeah, it's like three acts. And also you're getting the story from the inside... The per- well, particularly the middle third, Alexandra basically has no idea what's going on, mm. but you know more than her. Um, so she's a bit of an unreliable narrator in that, or you're more the unreliable reader. Hmm. Mm. Don't know. Bit too meta there, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like made that, it, made it sound The unreliable, unreliable reader, we need to investigate that. But my answer to that is I didn't plan to write a dual narrative, and that absolutely was what it should have been and I'm so happy that I decided to go for it because I was quite nervous about it really yeah I always think you know it's like it might because I used to be an actress but like as many voices as I can get in there as possible and let everyone have a say 100% I agree now and it was so refreshing to just kind of pick up someone else's thread of thought Mm. you know the the type the the typing the writing (laughs) came so easily to me literally I was just like in this other person's head like yep this is all coming out wow I feel like I've been possessed yeah Oh, that's um, great. In a way that I've never really written before. I have felt that a bit, actually, with the novel I'm writing at the moment. It was two voices, both um, analysing similar the same event. And then there was this third voice that just came in the third draft. And I was like, oh, the third piece of the puzzle. Oh, amazing. And it felt so good to go... Actually, it's a man. I, I've I just... Really, we were talking about whether or not we've ever written any men. I have a man, Stace. You have a male narrator? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Rogue. I know. It's pretty rogue. Yeah. But I don't know whether it'll Exciting. work. But yeah. I'm, I'm sure it will. I'm excited about it. Uh, next question. Yeah. How are we for time? Yeah, we're good. We're good. From Orm- Ormilla. Ormilla. BD. Ormilla BD. How long did it take to do research for both your books? <sighs> well, this one, not really long because it's contemporary and 1980s the 80s it was you know looking up what was number one and you know certain yeah. things about telephones and that sort of thing I mean I was born in 1982 it wasn't like the dim and distant past do you know what a word pro- I don't understand what that is I think my mum had one okay and she had yeah I basically just like whenever I describe so I love describing characters clothes and jewels I tend not to describe their physicality so much more in this novel than the other two but um I was basically just like channeling my mother's like 80s jumpsuits I love it sort of perms and bright blue eyeshadow that kind of thing so yours is more like cultural research for background oh, stuff I, I like that Stace yeah. yeah not just me like googling yeah. <laughs> what was number looking one looking at your baby pictures yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, but I think with the other two, I, I, I don't know about you, get asked this question quite a bit. Mm. It's not that you do a week or four weeks of no. library reading and then bash it out. For me, they go hand in hand constantly. Yeah, I like to I like to kind of hash out the story first and what's going to happen in it um, and plot it out, not meticulously, quite loosely, but I like to know what's going to happen in the story from beginning, middle, end. I always know how it's going to end um, and then I'll go away and look more specifically into the areas that I think I might need to look at. So in the Foundling's case, it was the Foundling Hospital, which is where I sort of started out the research, which was founded in the seventeen late 1730s. Um, and again, like with the familiars, this was a period I knew absolutely nothing about, didn't know anything about George and London, um, had actually was was surprised to almost be setting a novel in London. I just thought I wouldn't do that for some reason. I'm so glad you did. I have to set a novel there. I really have to need to be able to like add something mm. to it rather than just kind of join in the chorus. <laughs> like yeah. what do I what can I bring to it? Yeah. 
um so I went away and I looked at um I, I don't I don't read I don't do absolutely loads of research I kind of focus it down and do it in like two or three months usually and then start the writing after that so I looked at like Billingsgate crime punishment slang food drink life of the poor domestic service all the texture. life of people of color yeah um so I'll, I'll kind of become a mini expert in those very specific areas and then I kind of mm. go away and take a view yeah and the great thing about research as well is I don't know if you find this it throws up loads more plot ideas oh well. yeah definitely yeah yeah when you're a bit stuck for inspiration you just like dive into a recipe book or Oops. something oh careful with oh, that love gosh. we're on a we're on a bit <laughs> of a rocky desk there. um but yeah that's yeah, that's true. And I think I I always want to try and remember when I'm writing any historical fiction that, you know, you're not giving a history lesson. That's it. You're not... These people don't feel like they're, they're sitting in history. Like, yeah. they're not having a historical cup of tea and a, like, exactly. meaningful carriage ride. They are the most modern people to themselves. Yeah. Ever in existence. Yeah. And I, I think that's definitely what I kept in mind when I wrote The Miniaturist, definitely. Um, but... So I do tend to kind of maintain the motto that story is king. And I want to get that story out more than I want to prove to a reader that I'm, you know, the expert on lace collars in 1701 Absolutely. Holland yeah. or something. Because it can have all that detail in there, but if you don't yes. care about the story or the characters, yeah. then you don't, you're not no. going to carry on reading. Yeah. Agree. I'm going to just pick it out, but you can read it. Okay. Isla Finn says, advice for people writing their first novel. Um, advice for people writing their first novel. Uh, my Write advice it. would be, yeah, Write unfortunately, it. it's really, it's really a, a dull piece of advice, but finish it um, because it's all downhill. It's all downhill <laughs> from once you've written the end. <laughs> no, you have to keep going. Yeah. It's never as easy as you think. And also when you think you've finished it, you haven't. And I say that from personal experience. Oh, 100%. I you can't have to... anything worse than my first draft being no. published. Oh my God. Oh my God, horrendous. But you have to want it and you have to, you know, other things have to really go by the side. A social life. Not that many of us have one really at the moment, but yeah. um, I would compromises. Say try and, I would say try and keep it for as long as, as long as you can before you want to throw it out the window because there is the urge to... Um, say if it takes you like I don't know years to write it you might then finish the first draft finally and think oh my god I'm right I'm now going to send it to agents because I've been writing it for so long but it definitely won't be in a state for you to no. send to agents so perfect it redraft it as many times as it takes um it might be worth sending it to a few friends whose opinion you trust who like to read um you just got to basically you just got to spend a lot of time with it and if you think you've spent enough time with it you probably still have quite a while to go yeah I think it's just um I'm just going through looking at because I'm aware of the time yeah. like for some good quizzes before we okay. go um yeah I think it's about how much you want it and just how much you're prepared to sit with the imperfection of it and to understand that it is not like what is in your mind will never ever make it onto the page like the, the act of like the kind of beautiful cathedral in your mind's eye of your novel basically comes out as a squat little bungalow that's true i'm not talking about your books there space it's a little bungalow. referring to my own there <laughs> the cathedral the bungalow <laughs> no <laughs> but i'm just saying it, it is just yeah i mean it's a journey that you go on and, and it's a it's a relationship that you have to develop with yourself as well i think without wanting to sound too sort of new age but it, it you know it is an engagement with yourself on a level that perhaps other things you don't have to deal with like that. Definitely. It's not it's not escape. It's like turning up oh, to meet no. yourself, right? It's like pressing a wound, isn't it, every single day? Ooh, oh a bruise. A bruise. <laughs> yeah. Shepherd ninety one nine. Do your agent or editor nag you about writing deadlines? Um no. I've never been nagged. I handed in the family a couple of weeks late and I I used to be a journalist before I was a novelist um, and a bit, there was a bit of crossover as well. So I'm extremely motivated by deadlines and take them very literally. So when I thought I was going to, well, when I knew I was going to miss the deadline, I was distraught and I was so stressed and was literally crying like every day for about two weeks before the, the date came and I emailed my editor, <laughs> um, my editor at the time, because my editor was on that leave. 
and I was like, I'm so sorry, it's gonna be like two weeks late. And she was like, that's absolutely fine. No worries at all, I look oh. forward to receiving it. And I was like, oh. Yeah. I've just <laughs> I literally had a nervous <laughs> Oh, it's okay breakdown. then. And everyone said to me, publishing is a lot more chilled than yeah. journalism. Yeah, it definitely. It I mean, not, sure. not that I would know the comparison myself, but I think it's almost sometimes expected. I mean, I shouldn't say this really, but publishers are kind of... They allow a bit they, of wiggle They room. expect it sometimes that authors may not deliver on time, but... Yeah. The deadline <sighs> thing is it, it, it's not like something to just laugh off though, because... No. It is always there looming and like whenever your deadline is set, I don't know about you, but literally that month takes on like, it's like I've marked it in red on the calendar and I'm like, only oh, <sighs> five months to go, four yeah. months to go, three months to go. I tend to set myself, this sounds so nerdy, but like earlier deadlines. Yeah. I mean, wise. this this year I was like, want to get a, a draft done of this by August. Can officially tell you that has not happened, but... I didn't beat myself up about it because I understood that, you know, this every book that you write is a different experience. Yeah. But um, And we're in a pandemic. And we're in a pandemic. But I um I think those dead those deadlines can feel very uncomfortable for me sometimes because I'm like I feel like I'm trying to create something from inside myself to a clock. Yeah. And that can induce panic and mortification that you're writing something poor standard just for a time deadline. 100%, yeah. But but the there has production to be an element of right, it as well. Right, exactly. Yeah. It, it is. It is. It's a business. Yeah. As yeah. well as being art. Um, oh, do you call it art? Yes. In fact, more and more. Like in the last couple of years, I used to be a bit squeamish about sort of describing squeamish. myself as an artist, or you know, and I was definitely one of those people who did not say I was a novelist or a writer and all of that. But I, I guess it was being a bit hard on myself. But actually, I hope that you... Yeah, okay. We're back. I think it's the time of night. There's a lot of people going on the internet, mm -hmm. I hope. Everyone's trying to watch this. That's what's going on. <laughs> Everyone's just trying to get Brilliant. on the internet. How, I think this will be our last one, then we'll do some do some fun ones. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, they're not, like, ridiculous. Okay, Stace, so you go. Okay. What's your most overused phrase in writing? Oh, God. Um... My character's hearts thump a lot. <laughs> yeah. Things often bloom in their stomachs oh, okay. or in their ribs. Um, uh, their eyes gazes, like there's a lot of gazing. <laughs> yeah, mine is she or he looked closely at she or at him or her. Oh, right. Like a kind like of he look. looked closely at me. Okay. Or she looked closely at me. Because it, what's hard about it is like when you're doing dialogue, you absolutely do need something to break up the dialogue, mm. but nothing that's going to like mm. be like the equivalent of banging a pan in the corner of the room. So like it has to be, yeah. it's trying to create that like intimacy, yeah. but without making it read like a screenplay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it that's is. what mine is. Yeah, no, that's... She looked closely she at me or he looked closely at me. Yeah, mine are, mine are to do with thumping heartbeats quite a lot of the time. I had a lot of them trembling in all my drafts. Really? Which kind of annoys me that I use that word because it's such a, like, womanly word, isn't it? Also, like, I don't ever trembles. imagine you using that in real life. No, I don't think I do. <laughs> she came into my house today and she's like, oh, I'm trembling, trembling. in excitement. <laughs> yeah, I was. I <laughs> All right. Oh, I love this one. If you had to write a short story every week or a novel every year for the rest of your life, which would it be? I would do the novel one. Cause, yeah. Because you get paid more for novels. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I... Don't No, you? do you know what? No, I'd be a short story every week. Would you? Mm, because a novel every year would, I mean, do me in. It would do me in. You'd be trembling. <laughs> I'd be trembling on the floor. <laughs> I wouldn't be doing these IG lives. Oh. I'd have lost the power of speech. No, I couldn't do it. A short story every week, as long as the short story was about... <laughs> Next one. Where is a place you've been to that you would like to write about one day? Oh, um, where is a place you've been to? I never really have. This is a question that was in this tub as well about where do you get inspiration? Don't really have anywhere that I've been to <laughs> and I don't have any ideas left this house no I just everything that I wanted to write so far I have like there's yeah. there's nothing what I'm trying to say is there's nothing in my store cupboard I tend to have uh, an idea once every three years so right. I'll get back I'll get back to you on that okay 
I'm kind of the opposite of that. So I get all my ideas from going to places. Which is probably why I came up with this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got the idea for the familiars at a place, which was Gawthorpe Hall. I got the idea for the family at the family museum. I got the idea for my third novel um, at a place that didn't immediately have a story attached, but I m- f- f- fictionalised one um, to fit there. Um, and a place that I've been to that I would like to write about is actually Australia. Oh, really? Yeah, I went last year. Oh, you did, didn't and, you? And um, absolutely loved it. And I think one of the reasons that I'm drawn to it is um, the whole like penal colony and oh. the expats and the emigrants and people just striving mm. for a new life there or forced to begin a new life there. So that's something that really that would interests cool. me and appeals to me. I, I love Australia as well. Mm. I, I've been there a couple of times and I'm just always stunned by the quality of the light and the landscape. It's just so beautiful. Yeah. Great people. Yeah, they're good. Mm. What is your relationship? <laughs> what is your relationship with social media? Um, a good one to end on, mm. potentially. Potentially. Um, my relationship with social media is actually a lot better now that I have set some boundaries. 16 hours a day or not at all. So I ha- when I'm writing, I have to delete it and I ask my husband to change my password so I actually can't access yes. um, Instagram or Twitter. Because I just find it really distracting, obviously, like all the boring reasons. But like, I also find it wires my makes my brain literally wire more differently. Yeah, yeah. Like it short circuits me. Yeah. And... Like, I've been back on Instagram for a few weeks now and I haven't even, like, read a book in that time I because I just, I'm just on my phone. Um, so with that said, I think I'll always have quite a wavy relationship with it where I'm on it and then I'm not and then I'm on it and then I'm not. I can't, I don't think I'm someone who can just use it safely from a distance. <laughs> I don't know if any of us are. Like, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. There have to be bound I've done the same as well because yeah. I'm just like... I cannot be on this right now. You're absolutely right. The way that it makes your mind think, I don't think is particularly uh, conducive to novel writing, which requires such sustained depth of engagement. And, you know, when you're just scrolling through. And daydreaming as well. Like, you don't... No, exactly. No one daydreams anymore or looks out of a window Mm. or sits on a bus, like, wondering, like, thinking about Mm. stuff. And without those thought processes, you don't actually have ideas for novels anyway. It's so true. Um, But at the same time, I think of where we're at now with social media and this sort of concept of connectivity. If it is a type of connection that's not about, you know, it's a it's a it's a it is a type of connection that's that's can help people and can genuinely connect people. And for me, it's like the only way I can make direct contact with readers or yeah. like control the narrative that's spoken about me is I can do that through my public Instagram but at, like at the same time the paradox is I won't be writing a novel if I'm like dillying around over an Instagram caption yeah so I think it's it's a double-edged sword it is I don't think it's going anywhere either but I also think that these things are generational you know everyone left Facebook who was a certain age and then you know I left Facebook. Did you leave Facebook? I did in yeah. 2012. Yeah, and I don't oh, regret. Long ago. Yeah, yeah. Eight, eight years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't miss it at all. Yeah, but I think with Insta, it's it's a bit different. But I actually I put it in the novel that you know uh, Rose's best friend Kelly is a kind of Insta mum. You know, she uses her life and her child's life, who is two or three years old, to tell herself out to to make herself feel valued or validated or important, and yet. She's handling it at the point of the novel fairly well, but the reason I put it in there is because I I think this is something that we think we're in control of and we are not in control of it. Absolutely. Do you read stuff that you're tagged in? No. Me either. Tend not to. Some sometimes. But generally I feel that, you know, we personal feelings sometimes get forgotten in that and you know I agree. I was stung this year. Oh, babe, I'm sorry. It's not fair. <laughs> it actually, it actually like triggers me now. If I'm like tagged in, some, I don't look on the yeah. comments bit at all. I just do like stories, DMs. Mm. And that's fine. Because people are nice on DM, but they, I think sometimes they tag you and stuff, forgetting that you're a real person. That you're a real person. Yeah. yeah, and also I feel that that is for them to be. They're discussing your book or something like that. I don't personally go out seeking my reviews anyway. No, I don't. I never read them. It's not part of the space I want to occupy or should be occupying, I think, as the creator. 
Yeah. What are your views on horoscopes, Stace? I am obsessed. <laughs> How about you? Um, I would say not obsessed, but I enjoy them. I don't sort of live my life rigidly according to... What is your sun rising and moon? Oh, Lord. I think my rising sign is Virgo, but I, my... I see that. Yeah, I know. Today I was very organised about this, but... You were. I was. I'm, I'm sorry. Very if I was, Virgs. Was, I'm sorry if I Virgoed you a bit. Well, no, I'm actually a, I'm actually a closet Virgo. Oh yes. Because I'm on I'm a Leo Virgo. I'm on a changing date. Oh okay. <laughs> Depending on which, where I read the horoscope, I'm. Um, but then I do, But now it's like a lot more. When I when I put in my birth chart, I'm a Virgo, okay. and I found this out this year, and literally felt like I'd learned that I'd, my birthday was a different day, or like I had a, yeah. my name wasn't my own. I felt like my identity had been ripped away from me. But I think there's definitely a resurgence of, like, interest and affection for it. Because... I agree. Everything is so, so uncertain. And yeah. it's a nice story. And I, feel I like just the, don't the older, think... The older I get and the older my friends are, the more interested in them than we are. Yeah. Maybe I'm a bit of a cynic, but I don't know how you can say... Well, I think they are. Okay. <laughs> Okay, it's a- We're Leos and our agent is a Leo too. Wow, well, yeah. That's which true. I think says it all. Okay, should we do this for the last question? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to read it? What did you want to be when you were younger? A vet, a pub landlady. And that was it? That's a good one. Yeah. And an act, like, back in the day, a vet, because I adore animals, and then I realised I had to be good at science, so that kind of tanked. Terrible at science and maths. And then a pub landlady, I don't know, I just liked serving people. That's quite random. I've never heard that one before. I know. From a child. I know. I used Had to... Had you been in a pub? <laughs> yeah, probably like <laughs> saw some pub landladies out there, thought that's a career for me. But you know, also ran a cafe out of my bedroom window, which literally was on the first floor. So <laughs> I think my long term thing was, was actress. Um, and writing was always just there. It wasn't, it wasn't a goal. No. Was just... I wanted to be an, actu- an oh, actress. Oh, really? Yeah. Or a wedding dress designer because I loved The Parent Trap starring Lindsay Lohan <laughs> and was obsessed with Elizabeth James. And I used to draw wedding dresses in my room. I still have all the sketches. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, or an actress. Yeah, I used to go to... Dra- I went to like probably five drama classes. Oh, did you? I didn't get just, quite as far as five. you did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's not quite... I wasn't an actress. Committed like, there, yeah. space. No. <laughs> no, I don't think I would have been very good. Um, but I think a lot of writers came from, you know... I don't think you have to be have acted at all to be to be a writer, but there's something about the storytelling thing there, yeah. though, isn't there? And also, I definitely feel that when I wrote my first novel, it was to write parts for myself that yeah. I knew I would never get to play, but that maybe someday somebody would. Yeah, I yeah. love that. What a nice note to end on. <sighs> well, um, our books are out today, I along with about eighty five thousand other books. Um, if you stuck with us, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And uh, yeah, this is going to go on the IG TV live. So you can after watch this. it again if Providing you so we press the right button. Yeah. Press end now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.